In this video, I'll be giving a movie review of the movie After Death by Angel Studios. It was released October 27, 2023. Angel Studios is famous for releasing a movie earlier that summer called Sound of Freedom and for their television series The Chosen about Jesus of Nazareth. And I'll be putting this movie review in the context of my book, Psyche and Singularity, Jungian Psychology and Holographic String Theory, as well as in the context of an online class that I'm providing, Immortality and the Unreality of Death, A Hero's Journey Through Philosophy, Psychology, and Physics. So in my book, which was based on a dissertation that I gave for a PhD in philosophy and religion with a concentration in, in philosophy, psychology, and consciousness from the California Institute of Integral Studies, it's based on Carl Jung's near-death experience from 1944. And I compare that to Leonard Susskind, Stanford string theorist Leonard Susskind, and Nobel laureate Harard de Hoof's holographic string theory with which they defeated Stephen Hawking in the Black Hole War. So the movie, After Death, I also cover most of what they discuss about the history of near-death studies in my class, Immortality and the Unreality of Death, and the book, Psyche and Singularity. It talks, for example, about Dr. Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experiences. So the movie starts with a bit of a history of near-death experiences in academia in the United States of America. And then it goes to interview people who actually had near-death experiences, some of whom have best-selling books from the New York Times bestseller list about their experiences. And what I'm going to try to do is bring in more evidence from the field of physics for why we should believe that these near-death experience accounts are true. That was what I discussed in my book and in the class. And to provide an overall context, I'm going to discuss first Carl Jung's near-death experience. So the famous psychologist and psychiatrist Carl Jung, he lived from 1875 to 1861, he recalls in his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, that in 1944, he broke his foot. And then he was in the hospital, he had a heart attack. And then he found his body, or his soul, his psyche, rising above his body, rising above the hospital in Switzerland, and then rising up to about a thousand miles above the planet Earth. He said he could see the reddish sands of Arabia and the clouds and the curvature, the spherical curvature of the Earth. And he was above Ceylon, south of India, overlooking India. And then he saw a huge black rock hollowed out into a temple like the ones he had seen in the Gulf of Bengal when he visited India. Inside the black rock temple was a black Hindu sitting in lotus posture with a white robe. Behind him was a brilliantly lit room in which were all the people Jung said to whom I belonged in reality. He felt that as if he entered, if he could enter that brilliantly lit room, he would learn everything about his past and his future. And the language he was using indicates reincarnation. All of his past links of reincarnation and his future, he would learn about it. He was approaching the temple. He said his entire life was ripped painfully from him. And then he received his entire biography simultaneously back. But just before he could get into the temple to learn about his entire destiny, the psychic form of his doctor, Dr. H, rose above the earth and said, the earth needs you, the planet earth requires you, something to that effect. And then he said it was horrible every day. He woke up to the gray morning and he dreaded it because he felt so free, free from gravity and free from the cares of the body. And this is what he said, and this is the parallel that we'll see with holographic string theory. So he said, it seemed to me as if behind the horizon of the cosmos, a three-dimensional world had been artificially built up in which each person sat by himself in a little box. I had, been get, I had been so glad to shed it all, and now it had come about that I, along with everyone else, would be hung up in a box by a thread. So every morning, he said, it seemed to him as if the past, the present, and the future, as we'll go on to see, he talks about the past, present, and future being interwoven into one blissful whole, he felt as if the universe, the three-dimensional volume of space, the past, the present, and the future of the three-dimensional volume of the universe was outside at the horizon of the cosmos, and that we here in three-dimensional space live in our own little box of illusion tethered to the horizon of the cosmos by a thread. 
That is a perfect parallel for holographic string theory, which was presented by Stanford string theorist Leonard Susskind and the Nobel laureate Harard to Hooft to defeat Stephen Hawking in the Black Hole War, as Leonard Susskind describes in his book, The Black Hole War, which I'll be discussing to some extent. The parallels between near-death experiences and 20th century physics which evolved from special relativity in 1905 to general relativity in 1915 to quantum mechanics in 1927 to the union of quantum mechanics and general relativity in the early 1990s by Susskind and Tehooft, the parallels between that evolution of physics and near-death experiences fulfills a prediction that Carl Jung, the famous psychiatrist and psychologist, made with Wolfgang Pauli one of the Nobel Prize winning co-founders of quantum mechanics. Both of them, who are students of Plato, said that mind and matter both emerge from the same collective unconscious archetypes. And all of the archetypes originate from the ultimate archetype of the self, which they also called the God archetype, the unus mundus, and the one. And the evidence that mind and matter both emerge from the same archetype of the self is that the laws of psychology and physics should mirror each other. There should be a mirror symmetry, a parallel between them. It's something Plato also predicted in the Republic through the mouthpiece of his martyred mentor Socrates. Holographic string theory says that the past, the present, and the future of every bit of information in the three-dimensional volume of space is recorded at a two-dimensional horizon, the spherical horizon of the cosmos, where from our geocentric perspective, it seems that space-time is expanding away from us in every direction at the absolute speed of light. The past, the present, and the future are recorded at each point of this holographic film, and they radiate in with the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang, on these fundamental elastic threads of energy to create the cinematic hologram, which is Susskind's own phrase, of three-dimensional space. The parallels between Carl Jung's near-death experience and holographic string theory were precise enough to become the subject of my dissertation and then my book. So I'll be talking about this evolution of physics from special relativity through quantum mechanics into holographic string theory, including general relativity as we progress through here. But in the movie After Death, it starts out with kind of a history of the academic study of near-death experiences. So they begin by talking about Dr. George Ritchie, Jr., who was, uh, got his MD in psychiatry, and he was the first to lecture on his own ND experience, which occurred on December 1st, 1943. He was in an army base in Texas, and he got pneumonia. He was training to go to World War II. He was also about to start his medical training, and he published the details of his near-death experience in a book called Return from Tomorrow in 1978. But he began to lecture at various universities about his near-death experience, and one of the young uh, PhD students in philosophy who also got a MD in psychiatry and a PhD in psychology is Dr. Raymond Moody. So he heard le uh, Ritchie lecture at the University of Virginia in 1965, by 1975, he published his international bestseller, Life After Life, and he's the one who coined the phrase near-death experience. So I'm going to read something he said in the movie After Death. He said, in 1969, I became a professor of philosophy at East Carolina University, and in teaching courses on Plato, I began to hear these experiences from my students and also from other faculty members. So that's important because I mentioned Plato earlier. Plato was the student of Socrates. Socrates was the wandering philosopher of Athens who walked around barefoot asking people difficult questions about things like what is justice, what is equality, what is beauty, what is the soul? And ultimately he was executed for showing up the powerful men of Athens for being ignorant. He had to drink hemlock. He was uh, charged with believing in gods of his own invention instead of the gods recognized by the state and for corrupting the youth. But in the end of the Republic, Plato's Republic, that's the foundation stone of academia, it contains the original blueprint for how to educate just leaders in an ideal society. 
So in that famous foundational piece of literature, it ends with a near-death experience called The Myth of Ur, about a soldier who wakes up in his own funeral pyre just before they're about to light it on fire, and then he recalls his afterlife. Very similar to holographic string theory and to Carl Jung's near-death experience, Ur recalled going out to the horizon of the cosmos, where souls had to choose the lots that would determine their next lives. Out at that horizon were the three singing sister goddesses, the Fates, who represent past, present, and future. And, he, and they were handling the threads of each soul's destiny, the threads of destiny, which are woven into the outermost horizon and then follow each psyche as it reincarnates back in the central earth. So the same basic model of a geocentric model of the universe with earth in the center, because holographic string theory, general relativity itself, says no matter where you are in the universe, from your perspective, you'll be the center of an expanding universe. And where that expansion rate reaches the speed of light, that's the horizon of the cosmos. So the myth of Ur, which is the foundation stone of academia, ends with a near-death experience. This is extremely important to take near-death experiences seriously. That's what this movie was trying to do. It's criticized for being heavily Christ Christian-centric, but near-death experiences occur in every culture. And they do mention that in the movie, one of the one of the people who discusses his near-death experience was born in South Korea, and he mentions, you know, people from every culture around the world have these kinds of experiences. Although Angel Studios is a Christian company, and the people that they chose to interview were Christians, it's not exclusively a Christian phenomenon. So, um, in the movie, returning to this movie, Moody met with other academic indie. E. Researchers, Bruce Grayson, Kenneth Ring, and Michael Sabom. I'll be talking about Michael Sabom mostly. And they formed a group to compare notes in 1978, which eventually became the International Association for Near-Death Studies. And they had the Journal of Near-Death Studies, which they established in 1982. So from the original academic study of near-death experiences in Plato's Republic and the Myth of Ur, now we have the International Association for Near-Death Studies, in the United States of America. So Dr. Michael Sabom is a cardiologist, and he's also author of Recollections of Death. Here's a quote from the movie. He says, I was brought into this field kicking and screaming. So he read Moody's book and thought it was hogwash. He asked patients who had been resuscitated, and the third one he asked recalled a near-death experience that was similar to the ones that Raymond Moody had discussed in his book. So then he began a more systematic and thorough investigation of near-death experiences, and he questioned his own patients and people who have, who have had heart attacks, and he came up with the same kind of stories that Raymond Moody had discovered and put forward in his book. And Michael Sabom, a cardiologist, recorded his findings not only in his book, but also in the American Medical Association. So um, let me just read some of the academic credentials of these guys. Michael Sabom, MD, 1970. He got his medical degrees, MD, as a general physician from the University of Texas Medical Branch. And then in 1978, he got his cardiology training from the University of Florida. As far as um, Dr. Moody, he got his bachelor's, his master's, and his PhD in philosophy from the University of Virginia, 1969, a PhD in psychology from the University of West Georgia, and an MD in psychiatry for forensic psychiatry. So they are no slouches academically, and it's primarily it was them and some others who brought the idea of near-death experiences into mainstream academia. And this movie is kind of one more milestone along that path to make near-death experience studies part of our cultural, academic, and scientific tradition. It's there in Plato, and I argue in my book and in my class, these things should be taken very seriously. So I'm going to try to add some scientific evidence to help support the argument that is made in, in this movie, After Death. So just continuing here, here is what Michael Sabom, the cardiologist, said. He says, there's no way you can verify the transcendental part of the experience, otherworldly environment, 
And then he says, autoscopic means self-visualization. They were visualizing themselves from the ceiling, lying in bed lifeless, or being resuscitated. That is the verifiable part of a near-death experience, and that's what I wanted. That was the main thing that got me hooked on this thing. I pay very little attention to the tunnel, the light, the deceased relatives and friends, the religious figures. For me, as a cardiologist, scientist, and a physician, I wanted some verification. I wanted some medical records. I wanted to talk to people who had been there and seen what had happened in the room. So in a moment, I'll talk about the famous case of Pamela Reynolds, which they discuss in the movie After Death, which I also discuss in my book and in my class. But let's focus for a moment here on this idea of the autoscopic visualization of your dead body from the ceiling and the walls. It's a very common symptom of near-death experiences. Now, this brings me back to Leonard Susskind and Harard to Hooft. So, to give a very brief review of what led to their holographic string theory, Leonard Susskind, who was an atheist, or at least an agnostic, he presents himself as an atheist in his books, and he presents his version of string theory, which I call holographic string theory, as the antidote to the illusion of intelligent design, which is one of the subtitles of one of his books, The Cosmic Landscape. He said he was at a, uh, a conference with other physicists once, and he heard Stephen Hawking describe how information is swallowed by a black hole, which Leonard Susskind says violates the most fundamental principle of the conservation of information. Not only must the energy and mass stay constant in the universe, but the information describing that energy and mass must be at least theoretically retrievable in the universe. For example, if you were to explode a hand grenade, not only must all the energy and mass that was originally contained in that hand grenade still be in the universe somewhere, although in an altered form, but the trajectory of each atom of gas and metal that exploded from the hand grenade must be still capable of being retrieved in the universe. And if that principle of the conservation of information is violated, then the laws of physics fall apart, especially quantum mechanics, because of the nature of the waves of probability, which I don't fully understand. I'm not a mathematician, but the details that I'm focusing on are the parallels between near-death experiences and the laws of physics culminating with holographic string theory. So Susskind said I was losing my mind. I couldn't believe that Hawking was undermining all of the laws of physics, and yet I couldn't see a flaw in his reasoning until he came up with his theory. He said, okay, here's, here's maybe the way it is. Information that falls past the event horizon of a black hole where space-time is contracting toward the central singularity at the speed of light, if you were to follow that information past the event horizon, it is erased from the universe. It can't get back out. The energy is compensated by what's called Hawking radiation, which I'm not going to talk about right now. But the information describing what fell in is gone. However, he said, if you were looking at that black hole from outside of the black hole, you would see all of the information that falls into the black hole from the perspective of someone following it. It would get smeared out around the event horizon and then radiate back out with the Hawking radiation. The universe is an inside-out black hole. That's Susskind's phrase, inside-out black hole. From our geocentric perspective, all of space-time is expanding away from us. Wherever you are in the universe, according to general relativity, it will seem as if you are the center of an expanding universe. So from our perspective on Earth, it seems as if we're in the center of the universe and that space is expanding at an accelerating rate and when it reaches the speed of light that's called the horizon of the cosmos if you were to go past the horizon of the cosmos you couldn't get back in and any information that goes past that point of no return cannot get back in that seems to violate the principle of information conservation Susskind said yes if you followed it past the event horizon you wouldn't be able to get back in however according to the principle of cosmic complementarity, if you were watching through a telescope from a sufficient distance, you would see all that information smeared out around the horizon of the cosmos and then radiate back in with the cosmic microwave background radiation, the echo of the Big Bang on these elastic threads of energy. I've talked about that before. So getting back to this point of autoscopic, the holographic principle that Leonard Susskind developed with Herard de Hooft says that any information in any three-dimensional volume of space is simultaneously recorded at the two-dimensional surface area. And Susskind uses the example of his room. There's the three-dimensional 
desk and chair and his own body there in the room, all of that is like a holographic movie that's recorded and projected, recorded on and projected from the surface area of the room, the ceiling and the walls. Now that is a perfect correlation with these near-death experiences and this autoscopic visualization of your own dead body from the ceiling and the walls. I personally talked to a, f a friend of mine who was in a coma for a while, and he said, I could see myself 360 degrees. I was in the walls and the ceiling looking at myself. So this is a very common thing that people who have near-death experiences recount. So with that, I move on to the case of Pamela Reynolds, which they discuss in the movie After Death, which I discuss in the book and in the class. BBC also did a documentary on her famous case. So she had a brain aneurysm in the back of her brain and they had to cool her blood, drain it from an artery in her leg so that they could deflate the aneurysm and remove it without killing her. So her heart was stopped and it was monitored. Her brain activity was monitored. Her eyes were smeared with lubricant and covered and they put clicking mechanisms in her ear so they could monitor the hearing reflex. So she couldn't see or hear even if she was conscious. But all of the instruments monitoring her brain showed that she was not conscious. And she said that as soon as they stopped her heart, she felt herself pop out of her body and she was sitting up on Dr. Speltzer's shoulder, the, the head surgeon, and she was looking down at the operation. And one of the things that people comment on most often is that she saw them, they had to draw the blood from a artery in her leg and also the saw they used to get at her skull looked like a toothbrush, like an electric toothbrush. So she described what she saw and heard the people say during the operation, which she should not have been able to do. Her eyes were covered, her ears were had earplugs with the clicking sound, so she couldn't physically see even if she was conscious, but her brain had been shut down. How was it that she was able to describe the operation and have that confirmed by the doctors and the nurses who were there. So that's why it became a famous case. And this is what Michael Sabom said, I want. That's just what he says has really got me into this thing is specifically people saying, I look down at my body. So one thing that was new to me, having researched a lot of this, um, was Dr. Carl Green. So Dr. Carl Green, he said, I was spooked. She gave me details she just shouldn't know. So Carl Green went to study at the Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona with Robert Spetzler, who was a specialist in this field. And so Carl Green was learning from Dr. Spetzler and he was doing the rounds in the morning and he went around and he said, oh, you know, Pamela Reynolds, how are you doing? And she started to describe the operation. That's what he said. I was spooked. He was like, how could she have known this? Then he said, oh, I put the kibosh on the conversation, and then he went and told Dr. Spetzler, and then this became a famous case. How do you explain how this woman saw an operation when she was effectively brain dead and her heart had been stopped? The indication is that her consciousness is not isolated to her body. Her consciousness and her sense perceptions, her awareness is actually heightened, and she was looking at it specifically from the, well, she said the shoulder of, of Dr. Spetzler, but this is autoscopic visualization. Carl Jung also talks about one of his patients who had a near-death experience during a cesarean childbirth, and, she, and he said that she told him it was as if her eyes were in the ceiling. So the holographic principle from string theory, which again is presented by Leonard Susskind in an atheistic light, really presents the kind of parallel that Carl Jung and Wolfgang Pauli were looking for that they said would point us towards the ultimate archetype, the God archetype, the self archetype, which Plato called the idea of the good. Also, Pamela Reynolds recounted the typical light at the end of the tunnel experience. So let me just talk about that because that's such another, looking down at your body from the ceiling is a huge and commonly recurring aspect of a near-death experience, and so is hurtling down a dark tunnel toward a brilliant point of light, according to special relativity, which Einstein discovered in 1905. He was trying to account for the fact that no matter how fast or slow a source of light or a measuring detector that detects the speed of light are moving in relation to each other, 
the speed of light is always measured to be exactly the same speed, about 186,000 miles a second. Why is the speed of light constant, and how do you account for that in the laws of physics? Einstein said, well, space and time will bend and twist to keep the speed of light constant. The end result is, if you were to travel through space, or through the fabric of space-time, at the speed of light, which you would see according to special relativity, and what's called the aberration effect, you would see all of the light in the universe, even light directly behind you, condensed into an increasingly small point, smaller and smaller point, until you, at just before the speed of light, all of the light in the universe would be condensed in a single point at the end of a dark tunnel. The light at the end of the tunnel. So a part of my book, Psyche and Singularity, and the class, Immortality and the Unreality of Death, is that I equate the soul or the psyche with what the physicists call a gravitational singularity. Carl Jung wrote a letter in 1952, Leap Day, January, uh, February 29, 1952, to J.R. Smithies, and he was trying to account for Einstein's equation E equals mc squared. Carl Jung learned about relativity theory from Einstein himself from the years 1909 to 1913, while Einstein was working on his theory of gravity the general theory of relativity. So in the context of special relativity and general relativity, because Jung's writing this letter in 1952, he says, if psyche has energy, then it must be equivalent to mass. Why then can we not measure the mass of a soul? Earlier he had written letters saying, maybe it's because it's so small, we don't have the technology that can weigh something that small. But in this Leap Day letter from 1952, he said, maybe it's because it's infinitely dense. And he talked about how if you were to travel at the speed of light, you would disappear from space and time. He talked about the intensity at the, at the expense of extension. So the more you intensify the energy of something, the less extended it is in space. And he concluded the letter with this equation, psyche equals highest intensity in the smallest space. So the highest intensity of energy is infinite infinite intensity or infinite density of matter, and the smallest space is zero volume. A point of infinite density and zero volume is the definition of a gravitational singularity according to general relativity. Einstein himself rejected the idea of a gravitational singularity, which was first derived from his own theory by Carl Schwarzschild in 1916. In 1915, Carl Schwarzschild gave Einstein the first exact solutions to his gravitational field equations, and Einstein helped him get that paper published. A year later, Schwarzschild pointed out, hey, look, according to your own theory, if a star of sufficient mass were to exist, it would collapse indefinitely into a point of infinite density, and it would be surrounded by this point where space-time is falling inward at the speed of light. It later would be called a black hole by John Wheeler in 1967. It was first given that name, and that surrounding sphere is the event horizon. All right, so the tunnel vision, light at the end of the tunnel. They don't mention this in the book After Death, in the movie After Death, but that's a huge parallel in physics. It's not just the autoscopic looking down at yourself from the ceiling and the walls, which correlates to holo the holographic principle of string theory, but the tunnel vision correlates to the aberration effect described by special relativity. The same effect is described by general relativity. It's called gravitational lensing. If you are inside a black hole looking out through the event horizon, you would see all of the light in the universe, even light directly behind the black hole, condensed in a single point of light at the end of a dark tunnel. So physics says, yes, this is what you would experience if you could travel at the speed of light. People who have these near-death experiences say, I found myself rising above my body above the earth, and then faster and faster through space, which is talked about in the movie After Death, hurtling through this dark tunnel toward this point of all loving light. So I argue that the singularity, what physics calls the singularity, and that's where physics stops. It's not a physical thing. It's where the laws of physics end. They are no more, they're of no more use there, which is why Einstein did not like the idea of a gravitational singularity. He rejected it. So did the famous string theorist Michio Kaku. Hawking himself originally gave us a model of the Big Bang by inverting a black hole, by reversing the time dimension that Roger Penrose had used 
to describe a black hole. And then later he said, no, I don't believe in black holes anymore, probably because he doesn't like the idea of a gravitational singularity, probably because he learned that Pope Pius XII one time wrote an encyclical where he said the gravitational singularity, it seems like creation of the universe from the hands of God. And it does. There's a point of infinite density that stands outside of space-time where the laws of physics break down. It sounds like religion, not science, and so a lot of physicists therefore reject it. I talk about the controversy about infinite energy in the book, Psyche and Singularity, but continuing with this movie review, and I'm trying to bring in physics, which they don't do in the movie, um, another thing that they mention is that blind people can see. They mention this case of a girl, a five-year-old girl named Marta who drowned in a pond and then her consciousness rose above the pond and for the first time she saw bird feathers and a telephone pole and just the normal things that we see she was fascinated with because she had never seen anything in her life. So that was just another anecdote that they brought in. Uh, so a big point to point out here is that according to near-death studies, you do not require your five sense organs to have sense perception. You do not require a physical brain to have consciousness. As a matter of fact, they say when the consciousness leaves the body, the senses become incredibly heightened. You can see and hear and smell and touch and taste much more powerfully than you could when you were in a material body, which is obviously uh, flies in the face of the materialistic understanding of consciousness as a byproduct of the brain. They also mention hallucinogenic drugs. People try to dismiss near-death experiences as somehow being influenced by drugs released during the brain in stressful periods or because of anesthetics that were given to them in uh, the hospital. In the book, I talk about Stanislav Grof, a famous psychiatrist who was the last licensed psychiatrist to give people psychedelic drugs in the United States for psych psychiatric research until recently. It was at the Psychiatric Research Institute in Baltimore, Maryland, and he was given a license to give people uh, psychedelic mushrooms who had terminal cancer to help them deal with the fear of death. And it did help them, even the ones who had a bad trip. All right, so continuing here with this review of After Death, Michael Sabom says, I think the NDE is where science meets religion. There's a big difference between proof and evidence, but enough evidence at some point makes it so close to proof that most people would say it's right, it's real. So for him, what he said is he's most concerned with this looking down at your body from the ceiling and the walls. For him, that's what people should document, and they can focus in on that. He's less concerned with the light at the end of the tunnel and meeting the people to whom you belong in reality at at some point of no return, which I equate with the horizon of the cosmos. Um, but this is um, in the class immortality and the unreality of death. I go over the movie and I'm working off some of the slides I use for that class. So I say verifiable corroborations of earthly events seen during NDEs are empirical, like Pamela Reynolds. Oh, I saw Dr. Spetzler do this. I saw them use the saw that looked like an electric toothbrush to open my skull. So those are empirically observable. Yes, the doctor said that is what I did. Yes, the nurse said that is what I said. But I say, but so are the predicted parallels between NDEs and physics. And that was Carl Jung and his friend and intellectual partner, Wolfgang Pauli, the Nobel Prize winning co-founder of quantum physics. They said, look for these parallels between the laws of psychology and physics. And that will point to the underlying archetype of God, which is something the people in Angel Studios are trying to do. They're trying to bring people to a faith in the eternal soul and God, specifically from a Christian-centric perspective, for which they're taking a lot of criticism from the movie reviews that I've read online. But near-death experiences happen in every religious tradition throughout the world. Plato was not a Christian. He was born, or Socrates died in 399 BCE, so it's 400 years before Jesus was born, and yet the myth of Ur that he describes is very similar to the near-death experiences that Christians describe. For example, the Katha Upanishad from the Hindu tradition. That's a near-death experience of a Brahmin boy named Nachiketas. He's also told to, that you can take the chariot of the soul out to the outermost sphere of the universe called Akasha. Plato talks about the same thing in the dialogue, the Phaedrus. Even the, the 
analogy or the metaphor of a horse-drawn chariot going out to the outermost sphere of the universe where the absolute ideas like absolute justice, absolute beauty, absolute equality, they all exist out of this outermost sphere. In the dialogue called the Timaeus, Plato has an astronomer named Timaeus speaking to Socrates and explaining that out at the outermost sphere of the universe, the soul of the universe in the Timaeus is in the central point, which encompasses the outermost sphere and every point in between. And he calls that outermost sphere of the universe the mother substance. It's from the mother substance that the three-dimensional illusion of the material world is projected. And that mother substance is the intermediary between the temporal, physical, three-dimensional world and the eternal, absolute ideas. In the Christian tradition, St. Augustine, who was a Platonist, talked about the heaven of heaven. It's the mind of God where the ideas of God exist, specifically out at this outermost sphere. So I say, in addition to the common experience of looking down at your dead body from the walls and the ceiling, here are some of the parallels in physics between NDEs and physics that give us reason to believe that these near-death experiences are real. So the light at the end of the tunnel, which is the aberration effect and gravitational lensing effect that I discussed, the point of no return where we experience a life review and all of the past, present, and future of the universe, some near-death experience accounts call, and I say that is holographic string theory. Well, it's a combination of general relativity, which says that space-time is expanding at an accelerating rate. When it hits the speed of light, that's the point of no return. It's also where the past, the present, and the future are recorded. So people say, oh, I knew, I got to, for example, the gates of heaven. One of the near-death experience accounts talks about the gates of heaven. And I experienced my whole life there. The people to whom I belonged in reality were there. Some of them say, I know that if I went past there, I'd never get back into my body. So that is how a soul is experiencing what the physicists call the horizon of the cosmos, or at least suskind into hoofed, I'm saying. And then looking down from the ceiling, I equate with the holographic principle. Any three-dimensional volume of space, that information is recorded at the two-dimensional surface area. And then, although they didn't mention in the movie After Death, and nobody mentioned, oh, I saw these strings from the horizon, projecting from the horizon of the cosmos to create this three-dimensional illusion. We earlier talked about Carl Jung's near-death experience, where he definitely discussed that, and the myth of her in Plato's Republic, which Dr. Moody mentioned also. He said, you know, I first heard about these NDEs uh, from Plato and other, and my students told me stories and other professors. Okay, so that was just an overview of Raymond Moody and Michael Sebaum and what they had to say as far as being academics, the one a cardiologist, the other a psychiatrist. So now I'll go over four of the near-death experience accounts and just reiterate these parallels with physics that I discuss in the book, Psyche and Singularity and the Class, Immortality and the Unreality of Death. So Howard Storm former professor of art at Northern Kentucky University. He's a current Christian minister and author of My Descent into Death. In 1981, he is a professor of art, and he's taking students on a tour of European art museums. And when they get to Paris, he has this horrible pain in his stomach, and it turned out he had a hole in his stomach, and the stomach acid and the bacteria and everything was leaking out of his stomach into his stomach cavity. He said it felt literally like he was being burned by fire, and they couldn't get a doctor for him. He struggled horribly, and in the movie they, they have reenactments showing him and, and his wife suffering from this trauma, and they looked and looked for doctors. They couldn't find one. When they told him, we'll have to try again tomorrow, he said he stopped trying to breathe, and then he died. So here's what he said in the movie. I woke from my consciousness standing there next to the bed, feeling better than ever in my life. I could see almost 360 degrees. My depth of field was total. Everything far was in focus. All senses greatly, greatly enhanced. So he's an artist. He, he says understanding sense perceptions and describing them is what his stock and trade is. So he was particularly impressed with how 
excellent his sense perception was. He talked about he could feel every nook and cranny of the linoleum floor beneath his bare feet. He could hear the buzzing fluorescent lights above him extremely loudly. And then he says, he turned to his wife and he says, hey, what's going on? Who's, you know, why is there this dead piece of meat that looks like my body in the bed? And she didn't answer. He got angry. He was yelling at her. Why aren't you talking to me? So she couldn't hear him. And then he noticed some people out in the hall beckoning him. Hey, come out here. Come out here. And he thought they were hospital staff. So he said, hey, I need a help. I need a doctor. They said, yeah, we know what you need. Come on out. And he left. And he went out into the hall. He says, as soon as he went into the hall, he realized there was no way I was going to get back. So I watched some YouTube videos also in addition about Howard Storm's uh, near-death experience account. So I might accidentally bring in some of the extra details that I saw him discuss in those YouTube videos. But he said these beings, these people, he never saw their faces distinctly. They were human form but they always stayed ahead of him, kind of in the shadows. And they walked and walked and walked for miles. He, he said, where are we? What part of the hospital is this? Where are the stairs? And then he still hadn't, he was in denial. He still hadn't realized what was going on. And then the more he protested and asked questions, the more aggressive they got and said, come on, we got to get moving, move, move, move. And then when he refused, they began saying obscene things to him and tearing his body apart, ripping his eyes out. He wasn't dying because this was his psychic body. Then he realized what was going on. He realized he was dead, probably in hell. He's, at this point, he said he was an atheist. But when he was a child, he had prayed to Jesus when he would have nightmares. He said he looked at Jesus as like a superhero. So he reverted to that childhood practice. And then suddenly he saw a brilliant point of light from the pitch darkness of where he was up here. And then it rushed toward him, and he grabbed it, and it was Jesus. And he put his head in Jesus' chest. Jesus embraced him, and then they shot up into the sky. So there's this tunnel vision. Dark tunnel, brilliant point of light, all embracing, all loving light. If psyche equals singularity, which Carl Jung's leap day letter equation indicates, this is how I would define God. God is that one point of infinite energy that contains all other souls, God is each of us, but none of us is God. God sees through your perspective, my perspective, everyone's perspective, the perspective of quarks, the perspective of the fundamental strings of which the quarks and everything else are made. And God distills all of the other singularities, experiences into a unique experience of God's own. So God is a unique, self-aware being consisting of the individual experiences of every other unique and self-aware being, like subsidiary singularities. So here's a point that I talk about in the book. Robert Bruce Ware, a philosophy professor, he wrote a book about Hegel, and he compared Hegel's idea, the absolute idea, which Hegel also equates with God, to the gravitational singularity described by general relativity and quantum mechanics, and he brings up Leibniz's principle of the identity of indiscernibles. So Leibniz co-discovered calculus at the same time as Isaac Newton in the 1600s independently. He had a principle called the identity of indiscernibles. If you cannot discern a difference between two things, then they are identical. So you cannot discern a difference between one gravitational singularity and another. They're all mathematical point. No extension in space, so therefore they can't be differentiated by their shape or their size. Furthermore, a point of infinite gravity is equivalent to a point traveling infinitely fast. According to general relativity, acceleration and the force of gravity, g-force, are equivalent. According to special relativity, if you travel at the speed of light, then time stops and you are contracted in the direction of travel to, a, to zero volume. So a point traveling infinitely fast is outside of space and time. So if you can't differentiate them by their structure and their size, and if you can't differentiate them by their location in space-time, then they are all one. So in the Vedanta tradition, in the Middle Ages, there was a trend away from Shankara, who said that the idea of an individual personal self, or Atman, is an illusion that should be melted into the impersonal ocean of Brahman. That was what Shankara said, like a doll made of salt. Then the Vaishnava, Vishnu-worshipping reformers, 
came after him and they started to reintroduce the idea of an individual soul and one supreme individual soul, God or Vishnu, it culminated with Chaitanya in the 16th century, whose phrase was achintya beta beta tattva, inconceivably simultaneously one and different. In some inconceivable way, we are all one with one supreme soul. The Hindus call it param atma, the topmost atman, the topmost soul, the Holy Spirit, God. And yet inconceivably simultaneously, we're all individual, unique beings having our own subjective points of view. If you correlate the idea of a soul with a gravitational singularity, I believe that the physics of the singularity provide the mirror reflection of the psychology of the soul. So continuing with Howard Storm's near-death experience, he was pulled up to heaven by Jesus Christ, and then Jesus said to him, he said, he spoke to me telepathically and said, I've got some people that I want you to meet. They recorded your life and they want to show you. That's why I wrote that down. So the idea of information conservation, that's holographic string theory. Any information describing any three-dimensional volume of space is recorded at the two-dimensional surface area. So, for example, my body here and the microphone here and the camera and the computer are all smeared out on the ceiling, the walls, and the floor of this room. But, according to Susskind, if I was to go out and try to perceive that information at the two-dimensional surface area, it would recede to the next concentric border of space-time, which would be the, at the outer atmosphere of Earth, where Carl Jung said he experienced looking down at the Earth itself. If you went out there, then it would recede to the next concentric boundary, which might be the galactic halo. If you go out there, then it would recede ultimately to the horizon of the cosmos, where space-time is expanding away from Earth at the speed of light. The past, the present, and the future of the entire universe are recorded there. That's what Carl Jung said he experienced during his near-death experience that correlates with holographic string theory. And we see here in the near-death experience of Howard Storm, there is this idea of traveling through this dark tunnel with a point of infinite all-loving light. In this case, he identified that light with Jesus himself. And then having a life review. They recorded everything in your life. So moving on to the next near-death experience account that I talk about, it's Dr. Mary Neal, an orthopedic surgeon and author of To Heaven and Back. So she drowned in 1999. She was pinned with a kayak under 8 to 10 feet of water. So she's looking from underwater, just waiting to die. She realized, oh, this is probably it for me. But then she said, I would think about the fact that I must be dead, but I didn't feel dead. I felt more alive than I've ever felt. I felt like I was just part of the water. I felt magnificent, actually. I knew that I was being held by Christ as purely as I know anything. So she was waiting to die, but instead of dying, she felt more alive than ever. She merged with her surroundings, the water that was all around her. And then she said after about a half an hour, they gave up trying to rescue you know, rescue her, and it was more of a body retrieval. And she was looking down at them retrieving her dead body from above. She says, I could see this bloated purple body, but I never felt alive and then dead. I never felt conscious and then unconscious. I felt conscious and then more conscious. I felt alive and then more alive. And then another thing that I wrote down from her recollection was this idea of the ripple effect of her actions. So in the movie, they move from one near-death experience account to the other, and it unfolds gradually over the course of the whole movie. So you don't get the whole story from each of these accounts at the same time, I guess, is to keep your mind activated. There's a lot of special effects and sweeping music to put you in the mood of souls entering heaven. But I was just trying to isolate the parts that correlate most specifically with physics. So in her experience, she talked about how her actions and words, she could see how uh, 20, 25, 35 times removed from me, she said. She could experience the effects of her actions and words from one person to the next to the next, how it rippled out from her up to 35 people away. And she could experience each of the ripple effects of each of those people's experiences and how they affected others. If psyche equals singularity, and if we're all merged with each other at every concentric boundary of space-time, if we're all merged with everyone on Earth at the outer atmosphere of Earth, 
And if we're all merged with every soul conceivably existing in the universe at the horizon of the cosmos, which could expand to the multiverse, if you get into string theory, which I'm not going to get into the multiverse in this video, but the point is we are one with everybody. And she was experiencing that directly. She said she could understand how her hurtful words rippled out and she could understand when people hurt her, what led them to do it, what kind of abuse they had experienced as a child and how their grandparents and so on. So I thought that was just an interesting detail that seems to corroborate this idea of the oneness of all souls in the central point of the universe and at the horizon of the cosmos. So moving on here, Dale Black, author of Flight to Heaven and Visiting Heaven. He crashed his plane in 1969. So he's flying a plane with some fellow uh, pilots. They crashed into this eight-story mausoleum in a park. And they fell to the ground, and he was dead. He's, he recalls looking at these pilots' bodies. And uh, he says, I'm looking down, and I'm realizing there's my body, but I'm up here. I can't be dead because I've never felt more alive. I was not only alive, I was free. I realized, okay, I am a spirit, I have a soul, and I used to live in that body. So he's the typical near-death experience. He's looking down at his dead body from above. Then the ambulance came and they put the bodies in the ambulance. He says, I'm watching my body and Chuck and I'm chasing the ambulance as it goes through the streets. So he's hovering above the ambulance as it goes through the streets. He doesn't understand how he's able to do it, but he is. Then he gets into the hospital, and the point that I wrote down, because it has this correlation with the light at the end of the tunnel, he said, I started moving out of the room. I had left the hospital traveling almost like a rocket ship, just moving out of this atmosphere, as if in deep space, and there was a beam of light lighting the pathway of where I was going. Tiny spheres of light, these were beings going to Earth. The light I am looking at is coming from none other than God himself. So... This is the tunnel vision again. God is this infinite point of light that doesn't hurt the eyes. It's this all-welcoming, all-loving light, which I equate with the gravitational singularity, which you would see if you could travel at the speed of light or look out of a black hole through the event horizon away. Um, and also that bit about the, um, he said, I was moving in deep space. There's a beam of light. Uh, lighting the pathway of where I was going, tiny spheres of light. These were beings going to Earth. So he was going out toward this brilliant point of light, and another stream of souls was going towards the Earth, which implies these are souls who are going to take their birth. Plato discusses something very similar in the myth of Ur, or he has Socrates discuss it, where before going out to the horizon of the cosmos, Ur noticed there was two holes above in the sky and two holes below on the earth and some souls were coming down from heaven and some souls were coming up from the underworld and the ones who are coming up from hell were weeping and suffering and recalling the horrors of what they had experienced and the ones coming down from heaven were recalling the glories that they had seen so this implication of these holes in heaven these holes in the earth implies some kind of tunnels of souls traveling it just seemed very similar uh, to what Dale Black was talking about Okay, then the final one that I want to talk about, the final near-death experience that they cover in the movie After Death is from Don Piper, who became a minister uh, after his near-death experience and author of 90 Minutes in Heaven. So he had a car crash January 18, 1989. He was on a bridge, I believe it was Texas, and this truck crashed into his car. He says, the moment the truck struck me, I was standing at the gates of heaven. It was like the inside of an oyster, like pearl, almost like it was living, because the light reflecting off the gate. Heaven is light. God is light. It's astounding. He says, I was surrounded by people I knew and loved in life. He met his grandfather. He said, even though his grandfather looked so sick before he died, now they were all in the prime of their life. Thousands of songs at the same time without chaos, permeated by the music. My senses were incredibly vivid. The people parted and I could see through the gate. Along Boulevard bisects the city. He's looking into heaven, this golden city, a city of gold. So many of the things that we experience here are there, but it looks infinitely more glorious and perfect. So I wrote that down because, as I discussed earlier, according to Plato's philosophy, the absolute ideas of God's mind. So we have many trees, imperfect material trees that grow and then they die. 
according to Plato's theory, all of those individual material trees are projected from the perfect idea of tree and all of the absolute ideas are contained in the ultimate idea of the good. St. Augustine in the Catholic Church about 350 AD he wrote about he just called the ideas out at the horizon of the cosmos the ideas in the mind of God and he called that outermost sphere the heaven of heaven. Holographic string theory says the past, the present, and the future are recorded at each point of this encompassing horizon of the cosmos, and they project in here to create the cinematic hologram of three-dimensional space. Carl Jung recalled going out to the horizon of the cosmos, where he experienced for three weeks after his initial near-death experience every night for about an hour after midnight, he would experience these blissful encounters with the archetypes of the collective unconscious, what Plato calls the absolute ideas imprinted on the soul, Jung calls the archetypes of the collective unconscious. In my book, I equate the collective unconscious with the cosmic horizon from where the material world is projected in on strings of energy. So when uh, Don Piper said that everything's out there, but it looks infinitely more glorious, I see that as evidence in favor of Plato's theory of the absolute ideas out at the horizon of the cosmos. I also see that as empirical evidence for holographic string theory, ironically, because Leonard Susskind presents that theory atheistically. Here's a, a, one more point that I'll mention. String theory is an academic field of physics, but it's not empirically, it's not considered an empirical science because the strings of string theory are so small, down at the Planck scale. A billion, billion times smaller than a proton, to use Susskind's words. The 10 to the negative 35 meters, he says, so we don't have technology capable of seeing things that small. So then some argue, well, then it's not empirical science. Well, here is some empirical evidence. Eyewitness testimony of the horizon of the cosmos where people say they experience the past, the present, and the future, most specifically Carl Jung's. Carl Jung's near-death experience point for point parallels Leonard Susskind and Herard to Hoof's holographic string theory. Carl Jung learned about relativity theory from Einstein himself, and then he learned about quantum physics from one of the co-founders of quantum physics, Wolfgang Pauli, another Nobel Prize winner. The holy grail of physics after the discover of quantum mechanics was to unite it with Einstein's general theory of relativity, the theory of gravity. Quantum mechanics and general relativity did not mix. They were like oil and water, the theory of the very small, the theory of the very massive. You would think there's one cosmos, there should be one law of physics, but instead we had two. One for big and heavy things, one for tiny things. Holographic string theory successfully unites those two theories mathematically, but the strings that it predicts are so small you can't see them. So how are you going to prove it? Where is the empirical evidence? I'm saying here's the empirical evidence that Wolfgang Pauli and Carl Jung said we should look for parallels between the laws of physics and psychology, specifically in this instance, near-death experiences and holographic string theory. So that concludes my review of the movie After Death. Uh, I hope people who were impressed by the evidence presented there will be even more appreciative of it in light of the parallels that it has with physics.